In this video, we'll be talking about low power design. Now, low power design is an important concept for, for several reasons. Uh, one, well, it is better for the environment. We don't want to waste a whole lot of power in pretty well anything that we're doing unless we're creating an electric heater, or for example, where we actually do want to waste a whole lot of power as heat to heat up the environment that we're in. Um, but often we're running things off batteries, and those batteries, we want them to last as long as we can. Now, there's several things that we need to consider, or several things we can consider. We can consider things like energy harvesting, actually getting things from the environment to charge up our batteries or charge up our supercapacitor or whatever we're supplying it with. We've also got, um, in our microcontroller world, we want to maximize our battery life there. And many of our IoT devices or remote sensors, we want to replace the batteries as infrequently as possible. And so, uh, we'll be looking at a case study at the moment. Some, sometimes things are quoted as uh, 12 months plus, 6 months plus, and some devices might have a lifespan of 10 years where you only need to replace the batteries once every 10 years. And there's lots of design considerations there in terms of sleep modes, in terms of battery chemistries and things, and we'll start discussing some of these now. Um, in terms of a brief case study, here's something that I've recently worked on. It's called Rat Spy. Now, the idea behind Rat Spy is, well, it spies on the rats. Well, not quite, but almost. Um, you've got a bait box above there. Now, you've probably seen these scattered all over the place, and they've essentially got some anticoagulant uh, poison in there, uh, rodenticide, and the rats come along, eat this, and then they walk off and die. Um, but there's some problems with this. One is, what's actually eating that? Is it, is it rats, or is it your pet hamster, or is it some native field mouse or something like that? So what's eating it? That's, that's an issue. Um, the other is um, how much of it's remaining. Uh, at the moment, people need to come out every two weeks and, and look for evidence of infestation, like rat droppings and things like that. Not the most glamorous of jobs. Um, but also they need to check it, how much of that poison is remaining. Because if there's not enough, they might need to top it up. If it's run out, well, it's not going to kill anything, is it? So we developed rats by, uh, we're dealing with some commercial companies in uh, terms of bringing this to market. But the idea behind it is we've got a, a tiny little camera inside there, and periodically it will take photos and upload those photos to the cloud. And we use machine vision on those photos to actually look at uh, how much bait's remaining. And it also takes photo, photos when an intruder enters, so we can um, see what rat or mouse or blue tongue lizard, as we've seen, or snail or whatever else is going into that bait station and eating our bait. Now, we'll talk about briefly the system in this, and you can see a block diagram here. Essentially what we've done is we've got two microcontrollers in here. One microcontroller is dedicated to controlling the camera and getting the data off the camera, and the Wi-Fi module. Now, the other one that's uh, controlling all the power saving operations and our, our camera flashes and things like that. Um, so you can see on the table over there the sort of relative amounts of current that we need for each of these operations. So when we're in a low sleep mode, we're drawing, which happens most of the time, like well above 99.99% .99 of the time. Um, this is when it's in an ultra sleep mode. It's waiting to be waked up either by the timer, um, because it wakes up once a day or once an hour, whatever you configure it as, uh, or by the motion sensor. Um, it takes virtually no current at that stage. Um, then we have a mode where that first microcontroller is turned on, but the camera microcontroller and the camera and the Wi-Fi module and everything's not turned on. So there we're looking at about 2 milliamps. So we can be in there for a little bit uh, without wasting too much power. During the image capture, we're drawing about 150 milliamps, which takes a couple of seconds. And when we're sending the data out, well, that's the most of all. It's, it's almost half an amp. But that only happens a few seconds a day. So we can get lifetimes of many months with this sort of device because the things that uh, are very costly in terms of power, we turn off almost all the time. And we only turn them on for a, a brief period of time when we, we need to use them, and then we turn them off again, and then we go into a deep sleep mode. So let's go through some low power strategies. How do we get low power design, low power devices, so the batteries last as long as possible? Well, firstly, we can use lower clock speeds, and we'll go, we've got some slides coming up that we go through each of these. Uh, we can operate at lower voltages, we turn off things that we're not using, like the ADC or the timer. But we turn them on when we do need to use them, but otherwise we turn them off. Uh, we use all our sleep modes, and there's a bunch of different sleep modes. 
Um, we don't have floating inputs there. We remove unneeded components. For example, we don't need a power LED to show that power is connected all the time. That will just waste power. Um, um, we don't need that at all. Um, we have power down modes of external peripherals. So we might use a little field effect transistor, a little FET there to actually physically remove the power for something that we don't need to use. We can avoid regulators. So we've talked about regulators being 90% efficient or something like that for a switch. There's still 10% that's not efficient. And so we could avoid having a regulator if our, uh, our batteries are carefully matched to our microcontroller. And if we use the right battery chemistry, we can improve things significantly as well. For example, in cold climates, alkaline batteries, the long life alkaline batteries, actually perform very, very poorly compared to a lithium battery, which works better at a range, a greater range of temperature gradients. So let's go through each of these. Here we see that if we lower the voltage and lower the frequency, we use less current in both cases. So voltage, we've got different steps there. Frequency, we've got different steps. We have low, lower current. So if we're not after a, a high performance device, or we can reduce our current, run things off uh, three AA batteries instead of uh, four, or, or two AA batteries instead of three, we can save power there. Um, turning off peripherals, here's an example of the sort of currents that are required using our analog to digital converter. Now we see that if we've got our, if we're using our internal reference voltage, and if we've got the analog digital converter turned on, we're using uh, almost a milliamp. And you might say, ah, oh, milliamp, that's not very much. Well, if we turn that off, it, it, it's current that we don't need to waste, particularly if we're not using it. We might be taking a measurement once every second or once every minute or once every hour or whatever it is. If you turn it off the rest of the time, um, it will give you that little bit of extra power to play with. Next one is putting it to sleep. And the microcontrollers have a, a bunch of different sleep modes. Um, this is what we've got for the MSP430. And if you look at this graph there, we start off with uh, hundreds of microamps for not in a sleep mode when it's actually just being used, down to, well, pretty much nothing when we've got in a sleep mode. And you can see that we've got divided up between different voltages there compared to when we're running it at 3 volts, for example, or 2.2 volts. We see our current goes down as we expect. Uh, an important thing is thinking about floating inputs. Well, we know that we shouldn't really be having these floating inputs. We need to actually set them as outputs or use a pull-up. And we've looked at this earlier on when we've talked about interfacing to the microcontroller. Now, one of the reasons for it is, uh, um, aside from ac essentially acting like an antenna and providing potential instability when we couple noise into our microcontroller, each time they toggle, um, we're using current. And so um, for the reason of stability, but also for the reason of using that extra current when these things are toggling when we're floating, we want to tie them to something, either by using them as outputs, driving them as outputs, and then sending them low, for example, or having a pull-up resistor there. Uh, there's also that question of, do we need an LED? Um, sometimes we, we might want an LED to show the device is working. Does that LED need to be on all the time? Now, one example of this that you've probably seen all the time but may not have thought about is your, your humble smoke detector. And you've probably seen these. If you look at them for long enough, you might need to look at them for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You'll see an LED flash on for uh, a split second there. Now, that's a really good use of power because you've got an indication there that you've still got power, that the thing's still working. But at the same time, you're not using an LED on all the time, but your battery will only last days or, or weeks rather than uh, years potentially, because you've just got this quick flash that's happening there. What about powering down external peripherals? Now there's a few ways that this can be done, and a few different peripherals that you can do. They might be sensors, it might be a camera, like the, what we had on RatSpy, where we could turn off that camera. It might be memory, you might have like an SD card or a micro SD card there. There's a few ways you can power it down. Some of these devices have a power down pin. And so the power down pin, you send it a high or a low, depending what it will be, and it will turn it off or put it into a sleep mode. Um, if it doesn't have it, or sometimes they might not power down completely and use a small amount of current still, um, you can uh, remove power from it completely. And sometimes there's a command that you can send that you put into sleep mode and then you wake it up somehow as well. But using the FET like what we've got there, it's a, a P-channel FET uh, with a pull-up resistor there, 
Um, that P-channel FAT allows you to remove all power from that device whatsoever, and so once it's turned off, um, it will basically not be drawing any power, or just the, the minutest, minutest amount uh, of power uh, based on the, the FAT that you've got there. We've talked about avoiding regulators. So we want regulators if we've got uh, multiple different input voltages and we want to step them down and uh, remove noise and things like that when we've got maybe some AC or DC power at different voltages or solar or wind. Your solar panels might be putting out 13 volts, but they might be putting out 18 volts and you want to get some nice voltage there. But when we're dealing with batteries, we tend to be more stable. Um, our, our two AA batteries will probably produce about um, 3.2 volts or something like that when they're well charged and they'll draw, they'll, they'll produce about 2.8 volts or something when they're flat. And so there's not such a huge range there. They're a lot more stable in terms of fluctuating less and we can deal with that with our devices. And of course not all regulators are created equal. Some of them are highly efficient, some of them use a whole lot of uh, wastage in terms of doing that regulation, we waste more power. There's also that battery chemistry. So there's lots and lots of different batteries and here's a, a non-exhaustive list of rechargeable options from the supercapacitors, which technically aren't batteries of course, through to lithium polymer, lithium ion, the lead acid batteries, the nickel metal hydrides, NICADs, and you've got lots of non-rechargeable options as well. Uh, lithium batteries, which are particularly good for temperature stability, um, alkaline batteries and the, the carbon zinc ones that don't do very well. And really it comes down to uh, a toss up of things like size, how much room have you got, how much load have you got, what temperature coefficients do you need to work over, your, your temperatures and pressures, are you working in a dangerous environment, uh, all of those sort of things are important to consider around our battery chemistries there.